Hello and welcome to Living a Culture of Life podcast by Human Life International. I'm your host, Colleen, and I'm joined today by Amanda Ackman. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome back. Good to be here. Yeah. So the last, you were on about a year ago, I think, at this point, and we talked about why it's important to tell stories about death. And today we're going to be focusing more on your home country of Canada and the situation there was regarding euthanasia. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just start by you telling our audience what you've been up to in the past year? (laughs) Sure. So to back up a little bit, euthanasia became legalized nationwide in Canada in 2016. And I've been paying attention to this issue ever since. At the time my grandfather was living with us, he was in his 90s, and the government was talking about euthanasia for those whose deaths are reasonably foreseeable. And anyone who has a 90-year-old in their life knows that that means them. Mm -hmm. And so at the time I was concerned about it, thinking about it, And then after some travels and studies abroad, I came back to Canada and the government was planning an expansion of euthanasia on the basis of disability and mental illness. And at the time I was working with a member of parliament trying to prevent this expansion. Mm -hmm. And then some more travels and studies. And I realized how many lives this is touching, how many people I personally know who are affected by this expansion. Because euthanasia sends a message that Maybe it's not so good that you're here. Maybe it would be better for you not to exist. It throws people into self-doubt about the goodness and the worth of their lives and about their place of belonging in the community. And all of this really weighed on my heart. So it was in January 2021 that I made a New Year's resolution to blog about death every day for an entire year. Wow. I did that. And since then, I've decided to take that blogging project, which I called Dying to Meet You, Mm -hmm. to the next level. And this year, I'm doing a year-long project under that banner of Dying to Meet You. And it's a mix of releasing short films, writing, speaking, traveling the country, hearing stories, and organizing local events. And so basically responding to this cultural moment and to this moral urgency to do something Mm -hmm. about our end-of-life conversation in Canada. That's where, where I am now. Wow, that's that's a big thing to take on, <laughs> but so needed. What are some of these events that you've been putting on then? Because I know I've seen a little bit about it on your blog, and I'll link that in the description, the Dying to Meet You, for any of our listeners that want to watch, see it and look at what you've done. But can you talk to some of sure. about the events you've had? One of the first ones is, this is a big dream and goal of mine, and it was such a joy to be able to put together. I organized a day-long, diocese-wide open house event in my hometown on the topic of the church as an expert in humanity. This is a word that Pope Paul VI used when speaking to the United Nations. And he said, coming here as as the church is an expert in humanity and has something to say about life and family because of this special social expertise. Mm -hmm. And so wanting to galvanize my home diocese with this confidence that we have something to say and we can show up and we can meet these issues. And so when it comes to loneliness, Mm -hmm. suffering, mental illness, all the issues that touch all of our lives, we, the church, are prepared and equipped and have the resources to meet these through ministry, accompaniment, and our confidence in the power of God to overcome even death. So what I did is I organized this ministry hall of exhibits where I invited all of the ministries throughout the diocese that have an end of life focus. That could have been everything from the funeral lunch ministry to grief share to hospice to widows and widower ministries, Mm -hmm. all of them at different parishes. So maybe you've seen a a ministry fair for a particular parish, Mm -hmm. but this was a diocese-wide one to bring together specifically thematically life end of life related ministries was that so people in the diocese knew what was available to them as they went through this process or was it more to connect the people of those ministries with the other ministries a few different ones definitely they didn't all know of each other so it was to raise awareness a lot of times it was maybe a ministry existed at a parish in one quadrant of the city but Mm -hmm. not in any other one and so people are driving to that that parish for the widow's ministry once a month, Mm -hmm. where people could start it in their own quadrant of the city, which would be great. So it was kind of to spark the inspiration that if something was lacking, it could easily be started, or a funeral lunch ministry, or a funeral choir ministry, Mm -hmm. that these things exist. So it was a basis for outreach. It was also an opportunity for the ministries to get volunteers. And all the ministries, 18 ministries confirmed within five days. And they thanked me and they said, we have been waiting post-pandemic for an opportunity to do outreach, recruitment, and increase our visibility in the community. So the timing was just right, and 
the hunger was there. So we had this ministry ha hall of exhibits mm -hmm. in the uh, cathedral hall right next to the, the main cathedral in my hometown. And so 18 table displays and people came after morning mass. There were 200 people who attended this event. Um, we also had a Middle Eastern lunch. I was very passionate about serving everyone Lebanese food because I believe that if you serve someone a beautiful Middle Eastern meal, even if they're asking for euthanasia, and that person cannot eat a single morsel, they will immediately recant the request for euthanasia <laughs> just because of how beautiful and aesthetically pleasing the food is. So convinced of that in my studies throughout <laughs> the Middle East, I wanted to humanize and dignify the attendees of this event with a great Lebanese lunch, which we had. And then we moved over to the pastoral center basement, where we had an amazing afternoon of panel discussions. The first panel was on death and culture. And I had an indigenous elderly woman, a Filipino deacon, um, a Ukrainian lay woman who works with refugees, and a Chaldean Catholic priest all speak about death and dying as Catholics from these unique cultural traditions. Oh, it was amazing. The next panel was called Tell Me About the Hour of Death. And we had two doctors. Mm -hmm. One works in palliative care. And one, uh, well, they both actually have a palliative care dimension. Mm -hmm. And then we also had someone who is a deacon and has been doing uh, basically accompanying the sick for many, mm -hmm. many years. And we had a priest. And so it was all about their end of life encounters and the intimacy that happens and is experienced, the communion of life that can be celebrated in those tender and often still painful moments at end of life. Mm -hmm. And then the last panel of the afternoon was with um, with an eye to papal teaching around suffering, death, meaning, and hope. So we covered John Paul II. There was a Polish Dominican who spoke about um, John Paul II's uh, letter to the elderly. Mm -hmm. Then we had a session on Benedict's Space Salvi. We had a session on Pope Francis, a uh, speaker on Pope Francis's uh, catechesis on the meaning and value of old age. And then we topped it off with a Catholic funeral director sharing what he wishes Catholics knew about funerals before they showed up to attend them. So it was a very rousing afternoon of sessions. Yeah, that that's a lot. And yeah, it seems like it'd be so informative and in a sense inspiring because death is part of the Catholic tradition and culture. Like we all know that we're going to die someday. And the whole point of like, you're trying to avoid sin so that once you die, you can make it to heaven. Like, uh, what's the phrase? Memento mori? Mm -hmm. Is that the remember your death? Mm -hmm. And we have the ashes on Ash Wednesday. It's such a part of the Catholic faith to recognize death and be aware of death and the reality of death. And it's so important to remember that and not sanitize it, not stick it in a closet, not avoid the subject, but put it in its proper context of, yes, this is something we're all going to go through and it's tragic, but there is life after death and there's that's beautiful too. And so again, so you're not running from it in fear or seeking it out in despair. Absolutely. And even though people were during Q&A and during the sessions, listening to and engaging heavy and weighty topics, to be sure, there was nothing facile or nothing simplistic to it. Everyone was there for a reason. They were drawn to these topics and conversations. There's a reason why 200 people came on less than a month's notice in my hometown in Canada to attend this this event created on very short notice. And it's because the, the issues matter and, and they concern all of us. And even in light of all of the weightiness, there was more laughter than I've ever heard at a church event. Like people were self-deprecating, they were lighthearted, <laughs> they had funny stories about end of life, they made, made light of themselves. And th there was just so much humanity to it that was absolutely beautiful to see. And it was ultimately really uplifting. And I think cathartic for people too. Mm -hmm. So when we come together as a community, we can bear a lot more than we can if we suffer these things alone. So it might be surprising to our audience of why an event like that can help counter the euthanasia culture. Can you explain for them how, like, draw that out for them, put connect the dots? <laughs> Absolutely. So the idea was to, of course, prevent euthanasia and encourage hope through an event that takes a broader look at death and dying because it's not simply a matter of opposing euthanasia. It's about mm -hmm. presenting a positive alternative vision. If we don't have euthanasia, if we don't have this quick premature checkout from life once it gets very difficult or painful, then what? Then mm -hmm. what does it look like? Then where are we? What do we do? How, how then do we live it out? And so we need to imbue that with a content. And this whole conference was the content of what we do and how we live and how we suffer and die if we're not 
pursuing the euthanasia kind of route there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really filled people with a sense of what's possible and what's beautiful. Like one of my friends spoke and in the evening we had a night of testimonies. Seven people gave uh, life testimonies that were narratively framed as echoes of the seven last words of Christ from the cross. Oh, wow. And it was so beautiful and so moving. So we had a privately sponsored Middle Eastern refugee. We had a member of the large community with a disability. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a woman, um, uh, an elderly woman speak. Um, we had uh, a friend of mine who whose daughter only lived for 38 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to hear how people contend with suffering mm -hmm. and to see it presented as testimony is profound because people might discount teachings, but they can't discount witness. It has such credibility, such capacity to move hearts. And that's what the day was full of. It was full of the credibility of witness. Mm -hmm. And in witness, in stories, we have the capacity to present people with a vision of another better way to do these things. Mm -hmm. That's why it's eminently um, successful and capable of pushing back against the euthanasia temptation. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. We had Father Bouquet on the podcast at one point talking about redemptive suffering for that very reason is I wanted, like, I you can't address topics like euthanasia or people saying, oh, you should be able to have abortion for things like fetal abnormalities without being able to address mm -hmm. that suffering does have a redemptive quality. There is something beautiful about it. It's not meaningless that it, there's a rich meaning to it. And I think it's so important to include that in the conversation that we don't need to run from suffering. Not like we should seek it out, but that there is a beautiful healing and suffering um it, like a soulful healing it's certainly a challenge and like we never want to skirt the the difficulty and the weight yeah. of suffering and our faith certainly um orients us toward that and i think one thing that's helpful lest we be regarded as masochists who don't mind kind of or as one person <laughs> in in the sort of um one kind of proponent of, of euthanasia in Canada went on TV and said, I'm not a part of the pro-suffering lobby. No. And so <laughs> neither are we. We're not part of the pro-suffering lobby. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not the point. And yet you're right to point out the connection between suffering and, and meaning. Mm -hmm. And the, the redemption that happens is when suffering is transformed into meaning mm -hmm. through love. Yeah. And that's, not. that's the redemptive character without love. What is the redemption? But with love, anything is capable of being redeemed and transformed. And, and so, yeah, you never seek out suffering for its own sake. But enough will if come. you're in a situation with suffering, you can accept it. And yeah, like you said, use the love to transform it and ha give it real meaning. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to remember that there is no good story without suffering. No. So often we might fl try to flee from suffering or live a life that is easy, comfortable, decent, to use mm -hmm. the phrase that comes up again and again in uh, Tolstoy's novel. Uh, in Tolstoy's novel, no, novella, mm -hmm. The Death of Ivan Illich, the protagonist keeps saying that he just wants for his life to go along easily, pleasantly, and decently. But eventually we find out that that's no way for life to go about, and we're not made for that. We're, and so every good story is a drama of suffering, and our hope is that the story will be transformed from the drama of suffering to the drama of love. That's beautiful. I love that way of looking at it. Um, what is the current situation then in Canada right now as regarding euthanasia? And you said it's legal. What happened to the mental health situation? Because sure. I know that that was supposed to go into effect last March, I believe, and they pushed it off for a year. And I heard they might push it off again, but they're not sure. So can you clarify that for our listeners? Yes, you're very up to date. <laughs> so uh, Canada, as I mentioned, legalized euthanasia in 2016. And mm -hmm. since then, more than 50,000 people have been euthanized. For mm -hmm. perspective, more Canadians have been euthanized than died of COVID throughout the entirety of the pandemic. And if you know anything about the extent to which we went as a country um, around COVID, this is a completely shocking loss of life that has mm -hmm. been uh, overlooked and, and very um, under addressed as the national crisis that so, it is. On one hand, Canada was doing everything possible to avoid any deaths from COVID, but on the other hand, they're pushing euthanasia and people mm -hmm. are dying from that by the droves. Right. And it seems to be the difference between a death that is chosen and unchosen because with the pandemic, your fate is very unchosen and we feel the precariousness of this life. But with euthanasia, death 
and life seem to be controlled and kind of mastered. So there's that. Um, the as I mentioned as well, there was this expansion um, after the legalization that initially um, legalized euthanasia for those with terminal illnesses, with grievous and irremediable suffering. That was all of the language at the outset. Mm -hmm. Then those with disabilities uh, were. Um, it's, it's so difficult to even speak about this because I hate to use such language of being eligible for death or qualifying to be killed. It's so awkward and sinister when, when you get down to it. But yeah. euthanasia was expanded to those with, with disabilities and with neurological conditions. Mm -hmm. And the law also expanded euthanasia to those for whom a mental illness is the sole underlying condition. That could be any form of depression, eating disorders, PTSD, and we know that our soldiers have already been offered euthanasia mm -hmm. and told it's better than blowing their brains out against a wall when they contacted Veterans Affairs seeking services. So it is a true scandal for, for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. It's it's truly shocking. And um, the government did, in the last moment, thank God, a stop or pause for one year the expansion on the basis of mental illness as a sole condition. I know that there were people who had March 17th, 2023, mm -hmm. circled on their calendar planning to ask to die on that day. They were then disappointed when the law um, was changed and then this year-long pause was put into effect. Mm -hmm. Of course, the hope of uh, my friends and I in Canada is that we want to make the pause permanent yeah. and, of course, to bring... Uh, to to repeal this uh, euthanasia expansion across the board in Canada. So there is a grave risk right now. Um, it is set to take effect March 17th, 2024, that those with a mental il illness as a sole condition could, um, could be euthanized when they request it. Uh, adults at this point, there has been talk about so-called mature minors, which is the <sighs> word for children in this scenario. Yeah. And, uh, but for now... Uh, the kind of target victim demographic mm -hmm. would be uh, adults with, with mental illness. And this weighs on my heart every day. Uh, mm -hmm. It definitely concerns people I love and mm -hmm. care about. And I feel not like I'm fighting for a law, mm -hmm. but for for people I love. And when people ask, well, how do I do this? Why do I do this? It's for people who I love. It's not yeah. because... I am, it's not for any other reason. I'll just leave it at that and say that I'm motivated out of love because I empathize with people who in the course of their mental illness or depression don't want to live. Yeah. And it's in a sense, those diseases or mental illnesses or situations in life, traumas, understandably lead people to not want to live. Yeah. And again, I, I empathize with that. And I think that the responsibility of others in those people's lives is to say, no, I will fight for you when you cannot fight for yourself because you're worth it and I love you and I affirm what you're feeling and what you're going through, but I will not facilitate your death. I will fight for you to live because love says it's good you exist. Mm -hmm. How wonderful that you are. And when you cannot see that for yourself, I'm here to see it with, to see it with you or to see it for you until I can see it with you until you can see it for yourself. That's beautiful. I love, I love that way of looking at it. What are some of the cultural factors then that are pushing this? Do you think that there is this despair that you're talking about? Do you think that people are seeking this for a mental health issue? I mean, I guess people with mental health issues are seeking it for mental health issues, but what's driving this push in Canada? Yeah, and I'm glad you raised some of those questions because it's very important to note that even though the expansion has not happened yet on the basis of mental illness as a sole condition, mm -hmm. the main reason why other people are asking for euthanasia who do qualify mm -hmm. is certainly exacerbated by mental health challenges. Mm -hmm or even by poverty or homelessness or other kinds of insecurities of life. So someone may have a neurological condition or, or have a physical disability, and it's very likely that that's compounded by some existential distress. And so we really do have a two-tier society where some people 
get suicide prevention and other people get suicide facilitation. I think that's super wrong, super immoral. But for the underlying reasons, the government is actually doing a survey annually. That is imperfect, but they report each year on the leading motivations that are driving people to request euthanasia. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because the number one reason that people give for their request for euthanasia, it's not physical pain. Mm -hmm. It's not feeling like a burden. It's not due to um, the other factors that you might expect. Mm -hmm. The number one reason is because people say they've lost the ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. Loss of ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. And so, by their own admission, my fellow citizens are predominantly seeking euthanasia for an existential crisis, simply put. A cultural despair. Yeah. And this is why euthanasia, it's a philosophical problem and a social problem and a cultural problem. It's not a medical problem because part of what uh, was really drawn out in the panel at the open house I organized with the palliative care doctors mm -hmm. is that through in first world developed countries like Canada and the U.S., we have the palliative care resources mm -hmm. to manage pain. And yes, people need access to those and they don't always have it. And that's that can be a, a big crisis, but uh, to which euthanasia is surely not the answer. Mm -hmm. But reasonably, pain is not the reason um, realistically, pain is not the reason why people are opting for euthanasia by mm -hmm. and large. It is. It may be a factor, mm -hmm. but it is most, significant, most significantly compounded by this existential despair. Yeah. And that shows why the work you're doing is so important, too, because you're really solving that root problem of giving people, the elderly, a meaningful activities to engage in or giving them that hope, being able to solve that problem of helping leading them out of despair into hope, into relationship with other people. And it's not only the elderly, it's also young people like us who have to ask what meaning, what activities make our life meaningful. Yeah. And if something happened to us, like if, God forbid, we get in a car accident or we develop a certain illness that precludes a lot of the activities that we think makes life super enjoyable and worthwhile, have we already cultivated the robust, like, strength of soul and fortitude and personality and inner resources. I mean, it's a lot of work to be able to decide and to know that life has a meaning mm -hmm. and that it's worth living in those circumstances. For me, this is a huge like daily um, task to think, what if my most important work to oppose euthanasia is how I, how I myself will suffer and die? Am I going to be up to it? Am I preparing myself with the inner resources, with the community life, with the intellectual life, with the with the habits? Who knows what I'll have in such a situation of vulnerability? But that am I giving myself the best shot to have meaningful activities, even when in a position of very acute vulnerability? It's a it's a huge challenge, but it's something that I think everyone deserves to think about. Mm -hmm. Can you d describe to our listeners your Massive a Lifetime event? Because I thought that was really beautiful when I heard about it. And I think that ties really deeply into this conversation of giving them a beautiful, meaningful experience. Sure. So one of the people who I met, and I'm having so many wonderful visits with people all the time. It's such a joy. I was visiting this 95-year-old uh, woman named Rita. And as soon as I went up to see her, um, she was showing me around her place. And she lives... Uh, in a retirement home, but like with quite a degree of independence. Mm -hmm. And she took out her iPad and she said, on this iPad, I watch the live stream of the mass 29 days a month. And one day per month, we have weekday mass downstairs and I go. And I was so struck by that. And so then, not actually with her, but with another senior friend of mine, mm -hmm. I went to one of those weekday masses and it was about 18 minutes no music, no involvement of the seniors in doing the readings or anything kind of liturgically. The most bare, rudimentary mass kit that, okay, it's understandable. And the priest um, has a lot of responsibilities. But I started to think, wow, if that's the only mass of the month that she looks forward to and, and waits for, shouldn't it be a little bit more special? Especially if each time, 
a person experiences such a mass, it really could be their last mass. Shouldn't it at least once in a while be a little bit more elaborate, a little bit more? And I've had the opportunity recently to be all over Europe in grand cathedrals. And it's so, it, yeah, it raises you to a different plane. It elevates it's, your soul. Like, obviously, the Eucharist is the heart of the Mass. And, like, yeah. the Mass with none of the smells and bells and just the Eucharist is right. enough. Mm-hmm. But there is something so elevating because we're like the body soul composite just to have all of the physical Mm -hmm. beauty there as well and the music. And yes, it's not essential. It's still beautiful and fully satisfying just as Christ. But being able to give someone that higher experience of the mass is exactly and that both Christ is worth it and the uh, congregation is worth it. And so it it raises everyone up to kind of uh, to have this like decorum and, and grandeur to it. And so I, I thought, well, um, I was also thinking about this beautiful quotation by uh, Diedrich von Hildebrand. And he says, whatever makes Christ known, there, like wherever Christ is made known, there nothing can be beautiful enough. And I was like, what is it like to take that seriously and to decide nothing is beautiful enough for like the entry of the king, for like what we are really experiencing uh, uh, in the mass? And so I thought it would be really beautiful if we could give seniors a mass of a lifetime what would it be like if we created a mass experience for them to make it like it was their first mass last mass and only mass as priests are called to kind of cultivate that disposition when they celebrate Mm -hmm. and i also thought what can i do as a lay person to help facilitate that that doesn't require asking more of the priest Mm -hmm. or asking something of the bishop and so i just worked um in kind of cooperation with with a local priest and with the support of the local bishop to embellish this mass and to do a, a one-time mass in a retirement home that would be really special for the seniors there and to have a beautiful uh like beautiful chalice beautiful monstrance we also had some time of adoration uh as well to just show that like god thinks they're worth spending time with and on um, we had some beautiful reproductions of religious art put up around on the walls. I uh, added the Stations of the Cross to um, to the room, um, turned kind of chapel. Um, we had a choir from like a local choir school Aww. sing throughout the mass and they did a beautiful job. And then they socialized with the seniors after. Um, there were just so many like embellishments. Oh, the flowers at the altar a beautiful arrangement. Someone spent two and a half hours the day before arranging all the flowers at the altar and then um, giving roles to the various seniors to do the readings during the mass, um, bringing statues and crosses and just really like embellishing and elaborating it so that it would be really special and memorable. And they were so deeply touched yes. for sure. I was going to say that must have brought so much joy to them. And one of the big fruits of it was that the director at the retirement residence um, was so struck by how by how well it went that she uh, resolved to do it quarterly, to, to arrange it quarterly. So now I don't need to do it. It's over to her. And yeah. she has this model of what details to attend to in order to provide that experience on a quarterly basis. And that's really the hope with everything that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Take the ideas, run with them. If a diocese wants to do an open house, a ministry fair of exhibits on end of life ministries, a mass of a lifetime in your own context, go for it. <laughs> Take the ideas, run with them. Uh, these are not ideas that I I have to to possess. I have them only to release for the life of the church and to give ideas uh, to others. So if anyone does organize such a thing or is inspired, like I'd love to hear about how it goes, <laughs> but feel free to just run with it all the same. Yeah, I love I, I think it's so important to be able to engage with the elderly in nursing homes. This was something you and I were talking about before we started the podcast of do nursing homes create a culture where euthanasia is more easily takes root or do they foster an environment of community for the elderly? And what are your thoughts on that? Because like I said, we were discussing this a little bit before the show started. Sure. It totally depends on the person and what okay. the motivations are and what the family situation is. Uh, I was sharing that I think it's it could be a very cool environment to live like some of the homes are really nice and some of them are, are not so nice. And so there's a whole spectrum. And of course, some are very expensive and, and some are not. So there's such a plurality of things to consider. But I do 
find that it's quite amazing how many activities these homes offer their residents. Mm -hmm. Each time I go, I see a calendar stacked with activities. But what I do find when I speak with my new elderly <laughs> friends in all of these places, they say, yeah, like the schedule is full, but it's full of activities to keep us busy, full of mm -hmm. games and kind of games and the music. Um, not, not that these are bad things, but a lot of times the older people with whom I speak say, we're preparing to die. Mm -hmm. And those with whom I speak often say, and our minds are still sharp and active and we're thinking about our deaths and we're thinking about our lives. And we have a lot going on spiritually and psychologically. Where are the activities to focus on interior life or spiritual realities? And one of my elderly friend said, like, we just got all this new exercise equipment because it's what the young people who work here want. Mm -hmm. Whereas we want a room to pray quietly. That's not the room we live in. So I just find it so interesting to like start from the position of understanding the longings mm -hmm. of those who live in a particular community and then how those can be met. Okay. So you said that a lot of people get euthanasia because they're not engaging in meaningful activities. But then you're now you're saying that people in nursing homes don't want to do like the fun activities to kind of fill up your day. What do you think that those meaningful activities are then from your perspective yeah, that's and a the great, conversations you've had? It's a great question. Definitely spiritual activities okay. like reading scripture, um, service, mm -hmm. the extent to which a person can continue to be of service. Um, one thing that really moved me was when one of the elderly friends of mine in one of these care homes She's she's in her 90s, and she told me that she has all kinds of conversations with her neighbors. These are not normal conversations. These are helping them through a lot of family drama, helping them through a lot of grief, helping them contend. They're basically like counseling in friendship, but very much through a lens of faith. And what struck me in listening to her share this and how she would pull up a seat and ask the person, what are you going through? and be such a good accompaniment to these fellow residents is I was like, wow, she is doing the apostolate of the care home. And are we empowering and celebrating the seniors who have the apostolate of the care home? They have a lot of time to be present and to do this unique accompaniment that is all too rare that says, pull up a seat and what are you going through that can be such a rehabilitation of wounds across society, across generations. So yeah, I think the more that we can create opportunities to affirm and equip people to do the apostolate of the care home, the the better it will be as meaningful activities go. I've never thought about how people like the elderly in those homes would also want to serve. Like I feel like so easy, it's easy to put yourself in the position of, oh, I should be there to serve them. Mm -hmm. And that they've earned the state in life where they can just relax and sit back and it's our job to serve them and help mm -hmm. them. And but its service is so fundamental to being human. Of course, obviously, if I was in that position, I'd want to know that I could somebody else needed me. Yeah. Like we all want to be needed. We want somebody to need us as well as being able to foster that community and helping giving them a reason to be able to serve us and us being able to serve them. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a relationship. Maybe they can prepare a meal and that's why they're in a place where meals are continually prepared for them. So it's about finding the way that a person in such an environment has something to give. Mm -hmm. and being patient enough to receive what they have to give. Um, and that also is a service to them. Like I remember some years ago, I chose to live as an intentional neighbor to the homeless in a homeless shelter in my hometown. Mm -hmm. And the homeless residents, a bit of a paradox, but um, they that's what they were. They were in transitional housing out of the shelter. They very often wanted to do things for me, to take care of me. I was a university student and they wanted to cook a meal for me or they wanted to teach me something that pertained to one of the books for my courses. They were constantly finding ways to be useful to me and they lit up when they had the occasion to. So yeah, like it's part of our fundamental um, longing to be needed mm -hmm. and we can dignify others by having elevating expectations of them. That's funny. That story just reminded me of a story from college. We had this priest at my college who was retired and he would always do this thing where he'd like, be like, if you'd like helped walk him out to his car because he needed canes, he would be like, give me a, like, do you know that he was from Ireland? He was like, do you know the Irish handshake? Like, give me your left hand. And he's like, I don't look at you. You don't look at me. And he'll like slip you a $5 bill. 
for the girls, the boys who act with canes. But um, <laughs> anyway, one day he did it to one of my friends and he slipped her a $5 bill and she's like, father, no, like, I don't want to take your money. Like, and he's like, I don't need it. He's like, she's, he's like, you're supposed to give to the poor. No one is poorer than a college student. <laughs> it's just yeah. that attitude of like, no, I want to do something for right. you. And yeah, you might yeah. think as the young person, right. I can like, you yeah. don't need to help me. It's like, no, they want to but give. But the homeless and- resident as an adult <laughs> says, surely I'm going to take care of you college student who might be eating like instant noodles for all I know. And so, yeah. yeah. But it just, it made me think of that. Just that giving both directions and how important that is. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you see in the U.S. like from your perspective do we have that cultural despair here? Do you think what on a like cultural level, where are we as on the path to euthanasia compared to Canada? Well, I don't live in the U.S., but of course, I'm very close to American mm-hmm. culture and I do visit very often. And I think we have a lot, a lot in common. Sometimes mm-hmm. I think America has a bit more of a religious character than Canada. And of course, Alexis de Tocqueville noted <laughs> all of the uh, robust American institutions of kind of civic life here. And I think there's really something to that that's really impressive and and unique in American life. There's a lot of responsibility Mm -hmm. toward others and like good institutions. So sometimes I think Canada can be a little bit more like statist and government oriented Mm -hmm. on that. And that that has a toll. But as for the general existential tenor, our (laughs) our countries are very similar. Um, The degree of uh, secularism is very similar, uh, even still. And so I, I do think these are things to watch for and just to be mindful that it can happen all too quickly. It can be one way in a generation and then it can quickly change. And there is an effect that once euthanasia becomes more normalized, people think, why not? And there's a kind of deadening of conscience around it. I was just having lunch with a Catholic woman in downtown Vancouver. And she told me she knows seven people who were euthanized. Wow. That's how much it's touching her. Everyone with whom I speak is touched by it at this point. And so Americans might think like, there's no way that everyone is going to have several people they know who were euthanized, but like, don't discount the fact that that could happen and very, very quickly. And technically it's still illegal here but we do have assisted suicide. So do you want to make that distinguishment for our listeners of what's the difference between the two? Sure. So Canada has euthanasia and assisted suicide. Euthanasia mm-hmm. being where a doctor or nurse practitioner directly gives the lethal injection to mm-hmm. kill the patient, either in a home or a hospital, or even as our government is advertising in national parks, which is very... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> They're trying to get... Anyway, I... okay. So... Odd. It's... Yeah. It's strange that that's how they're branding it. But, um, and assisted suicide is where the patient is required to take the lethal substance him or herself to cause the death. In Canada, it's really, I mean, it sounds like I'm exaggerating the statistic, but it's really something like 99% are euthanasia and 1% is assisted suicide because people much prefer a doctor or nurse to do it. It creates a guise of medical authority and of kind of remoteness to the act. And not second guessing yourself. Yeah. And of being taken care of because it looks and feels like so many other medical procedures. And Mm -hmm. so it seems like a treatment. Whereas assisted suicide, you're really responsible for causing your own death. And so in the US, the numbers are much, much lower because assisted suicide is um, because the need to do it yourself, the requirement is a deterrent. Mm-hmm. And I would wish as a matter of incremental uh, movement on this front that Canada would would require uh, people to do it themselves because the numbers would go way down. Um, but that's something to watch because, yeah, as soon as doctors and nurses become mm-hmm. killers, it it really corrodes the doctor-patient relationship. Because you start to wonder, how hard are they going to fight for me? And then people think, oh, it's it only affects those who opt for it. No, because if, if there's any basis at which a doctor gets habituated to thinking, that's a case that would justify euthanasia. Mm-hmm. So take something like ALS or Lou Gehrig's. Yeah. Very commonly, people will give that as an example of something that would justify mm-hmm 
euthanasia. While all of a sudden, everyone with ALS who then does not opt for euthanasia is foolish. It's crazy. Why wouldn't they? And if you've just had all these patients who you did euthanize because they asked for it with ALS, then is that person with ALS who doesn't ask for it selfish? Mm -hmm. Or the they're the drain on their family. They're yeah. using it for financial like money that could be going to help someone else who could get better. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden you have this mentality of you're a burden. Exactly. Not we're here to serve you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it immediately puts them in a posture of insecurity about mm -hmm. the goodness of their existence and the value of their life. That's so unfair. So on one hand, assisted suicide is the first step of the slippery slope for Amer Americans. Mm -hmm. But then you were saying in Canada, if you could somehow push euthanasia to only be assisted suicide, you would hopefully save a lot of lives because people wouldn't want to go through that. It's so interesting how on mm -hmm. either end, depending on what your current situation right. is, how that could be perceived as a step forward or a step back. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you still want to go through the story of the woman with the tattoo? Because sure. that was a really cool story. So why yeah. don't you give an intro to our listeners and then we'll play the video. Absolutely. So one of my new elderly friends in Canada, her name is Christine. And I met her because everywhere I go, even with Uber drivers or on airplanes, <laughs> when people ask me what I do, I say I prevent euthanasia and I encourage hope. And so I was told as soon as I got back to my hometown, well, if that's what you what you do and what you're about, then you've got to meet Christine. Christine is an 88-year-old woman who has a tattoo that says, don't euthanize me. And she got this tattoo seven years ago when euthanasia was first legalized. She got it when she was 81. She always told her kids never to get tattoos. And then she had to <laughs> call them up and say, yeah, I got a tattoo. <laughs> and it's because of this crisis in our country. Yeah. And, and so... Um, we became friends. She's a very uh, fiery woman. Uh, we have a lot in common. We're kindred <laughs> spirits. Uh, I really love her a lot. And so we had several visits. I, and she lives in a, in a senior's home now. And um, so we made a short film together called Don't Euthanize Me. And we'll show that. And in this four minute short film, she shares the story, really the story of her life that led her to choose to get a tattoo that says, don't euthanize me. So yeah, we're yeah. going to play it. And for our audio listeners, you'll be able to listen to the video. You won't be able to see it, but I'll link it in the description. So, I was born in 1935. When the war broke out, we were in London. I would have been five years old at the time. I came to Canada from England in 1957 came to teach at a little country school in Saskatchewan and I married a local farmer. He was a good Catholic and he was quite willing, as I was once I discovered after a few years that I couldn't have children possibly. He was willing to go along with adopting the children. I got seven of them. It was just lovely. I was married to him for 36 years. He used to sometimes say some peculiar things. First of all, they thought he was bipolar, and then uh, they threw him on some medicine that didn't really work. She was paranoid schizophrenia, which she, which she was. So then what happened, Christine? What did you do about this? The last 10 years, well, as I look back on it as a reign of terror, I was scared stiff of it most of the time. Everything was piling in on me, and I couldn't see any way out of it. I just reached the end of my tether. And then I decided I was going to take, I had some pills that the doctor had given me. I was very much on edge and I just decided I'm going to swallow this. I'm going to get to sleep and that's the end of it. It was so wrong. I hadn't really thought about it one way or the other until after I did it. Because then, right after I'd swallowed everything, then I was concerned about the kids. And began to realize how wrong it was. And so I got help. The kids that I adopted were just so precious and so important. They were the happiest days of my life when I'm with them. How do you know for sure that you never want euthanasia? Euthanasia is suicide. Oh, there's no other word for whether, whether you get a doctor to help you or not. It's putting an end to your own life. It just made me shudder. 
people don't realize how short life is and how precious it is, we've lost our respect for life. We've lost respect for our own life, that it's a gift from God. Tell me about the story of the tattoo. During the war, they, were, they printed these cards and you're supposed to carry them in your wallet. And it said, I am a Catholic. In case of accident, please call a priest. You know, later on, when I was over here, I, I was so disgusted with the thought of euthanasia and I wanted to make a, a statement, but I didn't want to do like they did in the war, put a card in my wallet because you lose your purse. So I decided I'd get a tattoo. That would be with me forever. When I went to the hospitals, the nurses would see it and, oh, come on, so they call another nurse in. And think, oh, good for you, you know. And doctors walking by would give me a thumbs up because none of them wanted to be involved in helping live people to kill themselves. It just went against the whole idea of being a doctor. In light of how much you yourself have suffered, how can you see clearly the value of life? Because I know I'm here for a reason. Because God wanted me to be here. He wanted me to be born, be born into this family, have this life, eventually raise these children, um, do whatever I can to follow his way and to be with him. And the older I get, the closer I am to God. Respect the life you have. It's a gift from God. Wow, that was, yeah, really something. I I think it's hilarious that her you know, she hated tattoos and then she got one. <laughs> so, yeah, what what did you want to share about this story? What what do you think would help our listeners just be able to really grasp that? Honestly, what I can share is I had met her as I said several times, mm -hmm. and then she was very up for being in a short film, mm -hmm. and we shot a long interview. But when she shared about the time that she attempted suicide earlier in her life, that was the first time she was sharing it with me on camera. So the trust was building step by step, little by little, but I had not heard that story before. And then I met her to show her the first preview of the video to make sure she, she was okay with it and to make sure she liked it. And she said, oh, I forgot I had talked about that. <laughs> and I said, well, what you shared has so much credibility because of your vulnerability. And this will be the basis for resonance. It's not just a pious woman moralizing. No. It's someone who lived, who suffered, who gets it. And I hope that sharing a story like this actually leads anyone listening and watching our conversation to let their vulnerability be their credibility. That's what Christ shows us. Mm -hmm. In your wounds hide me, we pray. Um, and what does it mean to let others be hidden also in our wounds? That's part of how we can be in God's image and follow Christ is also be a shelter for the woundedness of others in our very own wounds. So I hope that the way she shares her story mm -hmm. and the way that it touches people's hearts creates an opening that we too can share because again, it's not arguments and teachings, but it's witness and vulnerability that moves hearts and that becomes the basis for that communion that transforms the drama of suffering into the drama of love. Yeah, that was the part of the video that really struck me of like she gets this this is someone who has suffered who's despaired and who's realized that life has meaning and like kind of reached that breaking point where life didn't seem worth it and then realizing no it is worth it and that just adds so much more power to her story mm -hmm. so that's really beautiful what like advice would you have for people listening to this podcast who want to go about cultivating a culture where euthanasia is unthinkable in their communities. What, what can they do? Okay. The first thing I would say 
is we all know people in our lives who care give for people maybe a child with special needs maybe an aging parent maybe a spouse mm -hmm. we all know people who are doing the who are living a hidden life doing the heroic noble self-sacrificial often thankless and unnoticed work of caregiving it's really hard mm -hmm. it's really exhausting it can be really even demoralizing and distressing and so what are we doing to come alongside and affirm that to affirm the caregivers so my encouragement would be first and foremost it might be a little out of the box it's different than contacting a politician it's different than a lot of other kind of advice that might be given in this domain but it's to think about that first person who as i was describing came to mind and come alongside and offer to do something or do something that indicates that you see and affirm the caregiving that they're doing. Maybe it's doing something practically to support them, to ease the challenge of that. Maybe it's simply admiring them for it. That could go a long way to emboldening their courage and their fortitude to be tenacious in that caregiving. I think that is one of the most important ways that we can create a culture of life by celebrating and affirming the hidden life of those who are doing the work most diligently. Wow. Yeah, not the advice that you would think you would have, but that is a really beautiful way of acknowledging this great service they're doing and supporting them in it. Because they know the needs of the people they're caring. They can do that most effectively, but making sure that they receive the support they need. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's beautiful. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we wrap up today? I'm so thankful to catch up with you about this issue. And I do get asked the question so often, how, how do I stay with it? How do I not get discouraged? And honestly, this is a mission that God has put on my heart. And while there are a lot of difficult and sad and painful stories, the intimacy of conversations and encounters, like the one I had with Christine, make it irresistible and make it totally worth it. And so whenever it gets hard, I just remember the profundity of these encounters, the gift of getting to meet people yeah. like you in the course of this work, and it constantly revives me to the task. So whatever we do that's difficult, we can be continually enlivened by that communion to which we are called to celebrate, because ultimately this is not about a fight, this is about persons. Mm -hmm. And it's about rekindling the deepest vocation of our lives, which is to love and be loved. I love how you brought that up, that this isn't, it's not about winning an argument. It's about healing. It's about bringing about that healing in the lives of everyone around us on everything, abortion, all the LGBTQ ideologies, euthanasia, all of these life and family issues is about healing and rebuilding the family because those relationships are so important. And yeah, it's just beautiful to be able to hopefully be an instrument that God uses to bring that about. So it's been wonderful to have this conversation with you in person, to get to meet you in person. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's great to be at HLI HQ. <laughs> yes. Hopefully you can come back sometime. And to all of our listeners, please like and subscribe. Check out the new ebooks we have coming on and keep on living the culture of life. God bless. <laughs> <laughs>